Yeah, so we hear, I've certainly heard a lot about the venues that men went to. Mm -hmm. So the Kenilworth, mm. the Laughing Duck that you've mentioned, Chaps. Were there any women specific venues? Apart from the lesbian discos, um, no, not really. There was a bookshop for a while, Woman's Own, which had a wee cafe to the side um, that wasn't. Uh, the but the bookshop was it was obviously was was obviously not not woman only. Though the staff did try to glare glare heartily at men who came in, um, but the um, the 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 cafe at the back was was meant to be woman only. Um, but I have to say, I didn't tend to go there very often because the the bookshop was fine, and the the, the cafe the cafe was very officially. Um, though we didn't say cisgender then because the word as far as I know didn't actually exist. It was very definitely meant for cisgender woman only, and that always made me feel a tad uncomfortable. Um, that was the thing that happened with the lesbian discourse as well. Um, it started because. According to what I heard, because there was one specific trans woman who wanted to go to the discos and who the organisers of the discos did not like, so they made a, a rule up that trans women weren't allowed the discos. And this turned into a massive war of letters and poisonous looks that went on for months. Um, I think I, I, I'm not sure it ever really ended. I mean, the, the lesbian discos stopped happening, and I suppose it sort of it sort of ran out of steam at that point. It, it, it was the first time they really come up that there was there were some lesbians who felt that um, trans women didn't belong in women's spaces, and who were prepared to who who were, who were prepared as I I thought to get ridiculously dogmatic in their belief to a point where there was um, there was a trans lesbian. March as a section on the Pride March for the first couple of years, um, swans, um, yes, self-identified so women are nesting. Um, they have a lovely banner, and they and they made and but the reason they were there was because at earlier in, in, in not that long ago there had been a bunch of lesbians saying you know our lesbians are for. Real woman born. The phrase he used, I remember then, was a born woman, which always struck me as being just wrong. It sounds uh, painful, you know, doesn't nobody it? Nobody's born a woman. You know, you, it, would, it would be extremely painful for your mother if you were. Um, I mean, we, I, I, I feel extremely comfortable with cisgender because for me, it just filled the lexical, the lexical gap. There always been, and there had always been this, this sort of lot like hand waving. Well, trans woman and. I don't want to say born woman. I don't really want to say biological woman. What do I? All oh, right, cisgender is a word now. I can say cisgender. <laughs> so with with the swans, I was actually at one of the pride planning meetings mm -hmm. when a group of the trans exclusive women showed up and basically complained that the women's space was going to be inclusive, that it was yes, going to be I, with I, anybody. I heard about that. I was not at the planning meeting, but it, it, yes, I heard. I heard about that. Um, the organiser of Pride basically said, you know you're free to organise your own space. We won't support it, but you can organise it. Mm. Did they? No. So it seemed like they were just there to cause trouble. It seemed to me, from everything I heard about the same kind of divisions happening in London, was that in Edinburgh, the, the community was just too small to have really sort of massive divisions. The the, the 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 discussion about the lesbian discos was really if, if you if you sat down with any of the organisers, um, I mean I did when we were doing the Rainbow City interview, I actually talked to one of them. It was quite definitely really about keeping this one trans woman out that you didn't like. If they if another if another if other trans women had come along and hadn't been this, who there were probably other trans women who went who simply didn't out themselves as trans women. And who, who weren't that one, the one woman we don't like, and who therefore you know got into this kind of problem. I mean, as I pointed out in the various letters I wrote to the Edinburgh Edinburgh Liberation Women's Liberation Newsletter, where most of the small was carried on, was no way actually for sure to tell if one was trans or not. 
you know, not in any way you can legally check the disco. <laughs> But we've come around to having these same arguments over and over again now, though. Yes, but I think it's more serious, more dangerous now, because the religious right in the US um, started this fight back in autumn 2017, and all of the really major British ructions have started since then. And I don't believe that's coincidence. We've seen they're using the same scripts that the religious right use for pro-life arguments, the same scripts they used against same-sex marriage, the same scripts that were used for Section to justify you know, things like Section 28. Um, I mean, obviously, there, are, there always have been radical lesbian feminists um, or just radical feminists who had an ideological interest in claiming that trans women are not actually women. Because the same rationale that says you can't have a boy baby at a radical feminist meeting because a boy baby has a penis and a penis is a tool of the patriarchy and therefore all the child at radical feminist meetings is for girls only. If you have a boy baby, you have to, I don't know, leave them on the hillside. I have literally you heard mothers having this argument with radical feminists about childcare provision about how, you know, yes, I have one daughter and I have one son. Either they both go to the child care provide, or I need to arrange other child care for both of them because I'm not bringing the daughter and then abandoning the son. Yeah, but because radical feminists, there is an ideological feminism that says the penis itself is the tool of the patriarchy. That means any penis, even one attached to a six-month-old baby, is going to bring the ideological patriarchal poison into your meeting and therefore can't be allowed. And I do think this is what's going on in the heads of some anti-trans activists over here who keep talking about a male body person with a penis or women don't want penises in their spaces, as if I always have this vision of, you know, floating penises like um, bobbit worms, you know, just sort of lashing around <laughs> the place. You know, it's like you, what, what, you, you have no means of seeing, to put it in front of you quite directly, you have no means of seeing another woman's penis unless you're on extremely intimate terms with her. And if you're a turf, it's really unlikely you're going to be on those terms. <laughs> yeah, I remember when I was young that they... So I grew up in Manchester and spent quite a bit of time in Leeds. Mm. And in Leeds, they seemed to be, at that point, there weren't enough trans women to be causing them conniptions, but they really didn't like bisexuals. Mm. So apparently bisexuals had some sort of penis cooties. Mm. You get, I, I remember talking with a guy, a woman whom I knew perfectly well, was currently in an active sexual relationship with someone who then identified as a man. About three years later, she came out as a woman. But as far as I know, none of us actually knew this at this point, including um, including the, 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 the not yet out trans woman. And this, so this woman whom I knew was an active sexual relationship with someone I knew as a man, informed me that she was not bisexual. Um, she was a bisexual lesbian, emphasis on lesbian. And I found this, so this was actually a, an object lesson for me that I've never forgotten about not arguing with people how they want to personally identify. Because I did argue with her. And then I realized, you know, exactly what am I accomplishing here? She wants to identify herself as a bisexual lesbian. I, she's not hurting me by doing so. Um, I will just let that, I will just let this one go. And I, and generally speaking, I have let it go ever since. You know, people get to identify, living people get to identify how they want to identify. Um, historians can argue about what they really should have identified as after they're dead, but when they're alive, you always just ask them, "How do you identify?" Okay. And I, but I, but I also thought part of the reason for identifying very very happily as I'm a bisexual lesbian was that she did not want to identify as bisexual because she was afraid of the stigma attached to being bisexual, whereas if she could say she was lesbian, then lesbians don't have bisexual cooties, even if they're having sex with men. 
And I don't think this really makes any sense at all. I mean, I agree everyone gets to identify they want to identify, but in terms of I free myself from my sexual cooties by identifying myself as a lesbian, I mean, you could just kind of go, there are no bisexual cooties. You know, bisexuality mm-hmm. is bisexuality. Um, but yes, I think I mean, part of my issue with many radical feminists is that many of them identified as lesbians without the central component of you know, finding women hot. <laughs> you know, they actually preferred men, but because they were radical feminists and penises are tools of patriarchy, they wanted to be lesbians. And so they identified as lesbians while not actually being attracted to the woman. I got that impression of the rad femmes in Leeds as well. Mm. And you got that with, um, there was a huge thing, I noticed particularly in London, where there was a lesbian, there was a whole lesbian area, a woman in the area in the London Lesbian and Gay Centre, which is a fantastic place. I mean, it's, it's, the, it's the largest, it was the largest and best equipped um, centre for LGBT people I have ever seen. And there was an entire sort of large room, very, very nice equipped sitting room with you know, tea and coffee and everything for women only. But you weren't allowed to use it if you were a bisexual woman. And you weren't allowed to use even S&M Dyke because both of, both of those would pollute this woman-only space. And in some ways, I thought this was hilarious. In other ways, I thought it really wasn't. I mean, I, I just think it was a very nice space to sit in. But I thought, how could you, you know, granted, I am not wearing black leather and I do not have a bisexual badge on. But, you know, I am, I am from Edinburgh. You have no idea what I might be doing in Edinburgh that might pollute your space in London. No, I'm just, I'm just not just don't happen to be admitting it. I, I the whole but the whole thing with not liking um, bisexual with S and M dykes was that S and M dykes were explicitly about having and enjoying sex with another woman. And if you are a radical feminist who believes lesbians are particularly pure and special and um, reject all penises and are angels who oppose the patriarchy just by being lesbians, then you're not going to like S&M Dykes who go around saying, no, the whole point is that we have really, really good sex with them. Let us tell you how. And I find, well, I'm not an S&M Dyke. I found you know, S&M Dykes a lot more appealing than radical feminists telling me that I was some kind of angel who spiritually cured the patriarchy by not having sex with men. <laughs> it's all very, I've told you the anecdotes about the radical feminists and the leather dark haven't I? I think you have. But tell us again. It's a... So when I was in Leeds, I was one of the volunteers on Leeds of the Paper. Mm-hmm. And I was the one who was given out in the north whenever the out in the north correspondents had failed to submit their copy on time. Mm. Um, one of the days this happened, one of the staff had been at a women's night the night before. I think it was Sarah the typesetter. And related to me what she had herself seen, which was this group of radical feminist women attacking a leather dyke there on the grounds that leather represented violence against women. Um, So I ended up writing about this in the column, Mm -hmm. asking, you know, so what does actually beating up a woman represent? (laughs) It was one of my high points because it got quoted in the pink paper. (laughs) Yes, um, the Pink Paper, of course, then did that lovely series of cartoons with Auntie Stunts. Um, the aged, the 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 the, el- the elderly lesbian always wore a leather jacket covered with studs, which um, yes, <laughs> and had a dog. Yes, the horror. Yeah. <laughs> there was a car- there was a cartoon for the switchboard, the, the London switchboard, at some point with this um, lesbian sitting with the ear of the phone. Um, Clearly listening nonstop to somebody and saying, no, no, calm down. To be a lesbian, you do not have to own a cat. <laughs> and you can actually always tell the audience of lesbians because uh, there'll be quite a few people going, no, 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 you do. It's a rule. You have to have a cat. You have to have a cat. I mean, you'll probably get fights about whether you actually own a cat or not. Or well, the cat owns you. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, my cat definitely owns me at the moment. She owns the place. Have no say. Yes. <laughs> so, I think I've reached the end of my notes. 
Right. So yeah. thank you very much. Thank Unless you. there's anything else you wish to talk about. I said I, I, I said earlier we were talking we were talking about um, coming out being political and that is one that I was thinking about that this morning in conversation with somebody else about uh, two funerals I went to one in 1992 with a friend called Eric who also worked in Gay Scotland who died of AIDS and at that point it was a very big deal that the rector of Old St Paul's actually referenced Nigel Eric's partner at the funeral and the funeral at the church was divided into Eric's friends and lovers at the back were all wearing black leather and Eric's family at the front who were in dark suits and myself and a friend of mine come and support me sitting in the middle of the church actually not really dead sure which way to go and um, after the funeral I and Eric's friends all went off to a nearby pub and a drunk and a drink and exchange stories and Eric's family all went off to follow the coffin with Nigel to the burial ground and 17 years later same pub same church friend of Eric's um, who had died and instead the the rector came to the funeral came to the funeral party afterwards we all had a big boozy lunch um you know Stephen's family present Steve, uh, Stephen's partner Adam's family were present um there was you know there was no division the there were workmates there were family there were friends also in the room I remember looking around the room remember other funeral seven you know 17 years ago and thinking you know if we we really have changed the world. We and we will go on changing it. And you can have people go. You know, I mean, we have the current scripts, the current people attacking um, trans people, and all set to attack LGBT people. They're not. Uh, it won't. It won't be only trans people they go after. They win with trans people, and we've got to stand together. We've got to push back against them, but we'll win because you know. This has been my my experience of politics in, in, in Scotland since I came out, that we get we get setbacks, we get pushed back, and they win so seem to be winning sometimes. In the end, you know, we do win, we're still here, we, we really do change the world, they cannot win. And I suppose if we're doing something called Queen's Day, then as somebody who's been in politics now for uh, getting on for 40 years, it will be, you know, that in the long run we always win and they always lose because they you know they're losers and we and we are not and that seems a nice high note on which to end this so thank you very much jane okay thank you